Hello, I'm John the Engineer Termal, and tonight we're going to be doing some Bible poetry, the Old Testament. So, keying on the interest, I searched the Bible through and found it loaded with advice on what we have to do. The Bible's filled with tales of woe, rich over the oppressed. It's there in plain old black and white, abolish interest. In Deuteronomy 2 3, verse 19, if you would, quote, do not charge brothers interest on money or on food, unquote. In Exodus 2, 2, 2, 5, the rule is manifest. Do, don't be like money lenders. Charge them not an interest. In Psalm 15, we see to dwell in God's home heavenly. On holy hill lives he who lends without the usury. Leviticus in 25, verse 35 is no jest. You must not lend him any money at an interest. Isaiah chapter 55, in it he specifies the way to answer when you hear the sound of needy cries. All you who have no money and are very hungry still may come and buy the food we have so you may eat your fill. And you who have no money and clad insufficiently do come and buy some clothing so that warmly dressed you'll be. Ezekiel in 22 verse 25 is the test. If you lend money to the needy, charge no interest. Ezekiel 3.18 adds responsibility. God states his laws for life with his expected certainty. And when I tell the wicked man that you will surely die, you will be held accountable if you don't warn the guy. But if you tell him and he doesn't change his wicked way, you will have saved yourself and he will be the one to pay. In 18.5, suppose a man takes not much interest. He takes no usury. He'll live. His actions I have blessed. Suppose he has a son who takes excessive interest and lends it usury. He'll die. His actions I detest. But if this son too has a son who doesn't do the same, he does not take the pledge for loans. His greed he overcame. He takes no usury nor interest that is too high. He will not die for his father's sin. The soul that sins will die. But if a wicked man turns from the sins he did commit, he gives back what he took in pledge, his sins I will acquit. Forgotten will be his offenses when I come to judge. Because of good things he does now, I will not hold a grudge. But if a righteous man turns from my law to evil way, none of his righteous deeds will count. He'll die, I do in vain. So cleanse yourselves of all your sins and cease to be such fools. I take no pleasure in the death of men who break my rules. Ezekiel declared that usury and interest could have a different effect. There was a simple test. If interest demanded is of something that can breed, such interest is payable and not sin, I concede. So if you lend a hundred head and ask to get two more, that might not be excessive lending that he would abhor. But if you gain all of the calves and he still owes you some, that would be judged excessive. That is more than maximum. And if the interest is on silver or some gold, it's usury because there are no babies to behold. It's interest if principle can breed to multiply. It's usury if principle cannot so classify. In Deuteronomy 2.8, verse 20, it does say that if you take the usury, the Lord will make you pay. He'll send on you confusion till you come to sudden ruin. You'll lack success in all you do, a melancholy tune. And though you build a house, you won't reside beside its drapes. And though you plant a vineyard, you won't get to taste its grapes. Your oxen killed before your eyes, and you won't eat your share. Your sheep and donkey taken, leaving you in great despair. Your sons and daughters to enslavement for your payments due, and worrying and waiting is the punishment for you. Some foreigners will eat the fruit of labor on your land. You'll be condemned to poverty eternal to withstand. He'll lend to you, but you won't lend to him. He will prevail, so he will be the head, and you will always be the tail. In Haggai 1.5, he insists, your way has something wrong. You've planted much, but you don't eat enough to keep you strong. You drink, but never have your fill. Your soul shoes have broken soles. You put your wages in a wallet that has many holes. In Haggai 1.11, unemployment God commands. As punishment, he called for drought on labor of your hands. 
In Haggai 2.16, he notes inflation once again. When anyone went to draw on wine, not fifth oil. Again, when anyone came to a heap of 20, there were only 10. When anyone went to draw wine, not 50, but 20. I struck the labor of your hands. You did not turn to me. Isaiah 28.19 says it will traumatize and cause sheer terror when your plight you finally realize. The bed is too short to stretch out. Your blanket is not wide enough to wrap around you. Thus in need you will abide. Isaiah 55.2 asks, Why is your money spent on what you cannot eat? Why labor on what won't content? Isaiah 44.19 says, They've not understood that half of it I've used for fuel. Shall I, shall I bow down to wood? In Proverbs 22, verse 7, it's clear for sure. The borrower serves lender. It's the rich over the poor. Job 20.19 says that heaven will expose his guilt. The wicked does oppress and seizes homes he never built. In Psalm 6.4, we hear complaint, O God, protect my life from the conspiracy of wicked men who deal in strife, the crowd of evil doers who in secret make their plot and whisper silently that it's a perfect plan they've got. Habakkuk 1, he cries out to God in all his pain for the oppression of the poor. He asks God to explain. How long, O Lord, must I cry, help, but find you do not hear? Or cry out, I see violence, but you don't interfere. Why do you make me witness sin? Why tolerate such wrong? The law is paralyzed with justice only for the strong. The wicked foe hooks righteous men into his evil net, and so rejoices in their subjugation by their debt. He therefore sacrifices and burns incense to his net. For by his net he lives in all the riches he can get. Is he to keep his net, destroying nations willfully? Is he to swallow up more righteous men than he can be? The Lord replied, It will certainly come. It won't delay. When he's brought down, he'll feel the ridicule in what they say. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and shake your throne? Will they not wake up, make you tremble, force you to atone? Then you'll become their victim, for you plundered nations great. Because you plundered them, their plundering will be your fate. For you've destroyed the lands and towns of them whom you disdain. And woe to him who builds his realm on such illicit gain. In chapter 2, verse 5, the arrogant still takes no bluff. Like hell and death, his gullet wide, he never has enough. Bill Gates. In Nehemiah 5, we hear complaints of greedy men, needy men, <laughs> of the conditions that existed in the nation then. Some said we've had to mortgage all our vineyards and our fields to get grain during famine, though they've had abundant yields. Some others said we've had to borrow money for the king, whose taxes on our fields and vineyards leave us not a thing. Still others said their flesh and blood is of our family tree, yet our children suffer under yoke of slavery. When Nehemiah heard them, anger great he could not mask. The nobles and the rulers were the ones he took to task. He called the great assembly where he chose to lay the blame on bankers, politicians who had run the game. Well, you are exacting interest of your own countrymen, unlike my men who freely lend to needy brethren. What you are doing is not right. You must do as we do. So stop exacting interest. It is the big taboo. Return their fields and vineyards and their houses and their grain, and also all the usury, the whole illicit gain. The nobles and the rulers said, they will not have to pay. We'll give them back all their possessions. We'll do what you say. Prosperity resulted from his ban on interest. Remember me, O God, with favor was his last request. And watch out for many Bibles where the most important phrase has been deleted from the text. The problem not to phase. The message Nehemiah states is stop the interest and give them back what you have seized and it'll turn out best. The newer versions of the Bible simply state atone and give them back their stuff. No talk of interest on loan. Who chose to cut the answer out? Who played this evil role? We know the ones who own the publishers have sole control. So Ezekiel 3, 4, 2, 7 says the poor will know when they've been liberated from those who've enslaved them so. 
The one who breaks the evil bars of yoke of slavery, he'll be their savior, that's for sure. No other can he be.